Good morning, everyone. We had a, a candle uh, lighter there that was not uh, not quite functioning the way it was designed. It won't pull the wick down inside, so it's going to need some maintenance afterwards. Uh, but welcome. John is uh, obviously gone today, and so I'm filling in uh, for him. He's actually going to be gone for two Sundays, uh, so Lucille Barb uh, will be here next Sunday uh, filling in. But um, we are happy to have you all here. Do we have any joys this morning? Yeah, Eileen got a certificate of achievement award for the post office. That's right. I understand. Eileen, congratulations. Certificate of achievement. <laughs> Top postal honors. Yeah. Got a 100% percent they have mystery shoppers come in. And she got a 100% on her, on her mystery shoppers. Wow. Good Thank job. Lord. <laughs> Most times. Any other joys this morning? <coughs> All right. Well, we've got announcements on the back of the bulletin. Uh, of course, our prayer meeting tomorrow night uh, here in the sanctuary at 6 o'clock. And then, of course, the Monday night Bible study following that. Uh, we are in the book of Joshua, the 11th chapter, hopefully, if I if I have everything correct. And so, uh, I already mentioned that Lucille will be here next Sunday. Um, the uh, Because John's gone, uh, you'll notice down there that on the 20th, uh, the third Sunday of the month, normally the first Sunday of the month is our month that we do, or our Sunday that we do communion. Uh, communion's been moved to the third Sunday since John was not here uh, to, uh, to bless the elements. And so that'll be on the 20th. Uh, right before that, that week before that, we've got the Ladies' Fellowship meeting on Tuesday at 6.30 over in the Fellowship Hall. Anything we need to say about that, Penny? No. All right. Uh, ladies, uh, show up and uh, have a good time. And then, guys, the breakfasts are starting to get fattening. They've always been kind of fattening, but they're getting really good. Uh, the guy, the cooks are, cooks are doing a good job. And so, if you want a good meal, men, on, uh, on the 19th in the morning, 8 o'clock, over in the fellowship hall. And so, we'll eat and then we'll have a short devotional time after that. Uh, but come and join us. And uh, then, of course, our Independence Day program. Crystal, do you need to say anything about that? I know some of the kids have already gotten pieces and parts. Yeah, and yeah I just might mention that we're going to do an adult choir. The song that we're going to sing is My Country Tis of Thee, so it's a very easy one, but it's also going to be mashed up with a different song. So if you would like to be part of the choir, come join us. We won't start next week, but the following week. Okay. And then the Women's Encounter of the Cross is coming up in July, right there that next weekend after Independence Day, uh, the 9th through the 11th. If you uh, are interested in going to Encounter the Cross uh, women, uh, there are several that have been, Lana, Penny, uh, Cindy. Uh, talk to any of them and they'll be able to get you set up. Uh, the Bible School, of course, we've got set up for the uh, 19th through the 23rd. And if you're interested in helping, talk to Michelle. And then Men's Encounter of the Cross, our, our next one is in August, August 27th through the 29th. So if you would like to go to Encounter of the Cross as a, uh, men, uh, talk to Calvin, talk to me, and we'll get you set up. Any announcements that I don't have? All right, what about birthdays then? I saw a long list when I typed them up and put them in the email, but I'm wondering whether anybody's going to fess up. <laughs> All right. Well, hearing none, what about anniversaries? I didn't see any of them, but who knows? <clears throat> Maybe I missed one. Seeing none. Children, why don't you come up here and join me? Although I'm not going to put it all out because it takes up a little bit of room. But do any of you guys know what this is? 
All right, it's a deer blind, it's a ground blind, right? So what do I do with it, Coulter? So it's a good, you put deer in it, you stand in it, and so you, it hides you. Okay, so I can sit, I can't stand in this one, it's too short. But I can sit on a chair or something inside of it, right? And it kind of hides me. Protects me from the elements too, right? If it's cold outside or it's raining or it's blowing. It keeps uh, keeps me from being rained on or snowed on or hailed on. Uh, does it look like it's in real good condition? Now it's not. There's actually a whole piece in here on one of these legs that's all broken. It, uh, it's not in the best of condition. In fact, uh, it wouldn't. Uh, it may not stand up another another year. Well, I may have to buy another one because it's, it, it's seen some hard use. Um, but this is is basically it's a specialized tent, right? Are you guys you guys ever use tents? Do you ever sleep in tents? You do. When do you sleep in tents? For the fishing tournament you did? You know another time that we sometimes sleep in tents? Down at the powwow, right? Down in Oklahoma, we sleep in tents sometimes down there. Yeah, would you like to sleep in a tent all the year round? No. Why not? Could it get cold? It would? Is there a bathroom in your, in your tent? Uh-uh. What do you have to do when you gotta go to the bathroom? Go outside. That might not be good if it's raining outside, but, or if it's cold. Is there a is there lights in your tent? Uh -huh. Maybe if you have a flashlight, but not a not like a, you do at your house, right? Yeah, yeah not like with the house. Um, is there a sink in your tent? Uh -huh. There's no sink in the tent. How do you wash your hands? You don't. But well, it doesn't sound like it'd be real, I mean, a good idea to live in this tent all the time, right? But there were people that lived in the tents all the time. Back when they came out of the land of Egypt, the, the Israelite people, when they crossed over the Red Sea, you remember that story from Sunday school? They walked across on dry land, land and all the Egyptians actually got covered in the water and ground. Well, they, after they got over into the wilderness, they lived in tents. But those tents, like these tents, they're not real comfortable to be in all the time, right? You gotta go outside to wash your hands, go to the bathroom, and all that stuff. So, would you rather live in a tent or in a house? You wanna live in a house? Well, that's what I'm gonna talk about today a little bit later. Because God has a house prepared for us. And it says in the Bible that when we're down here on earth, when we're living, it's kind of like living in a tent. It's temporary. But we actually have a place that God has prepared for us, a house to go live. We would much rather live in the house, right? Yeah, because it's much more comfortable. It's got sinks. It's got uh, bathrooms. Is the important really it's important. Got a, it's got a bed. It's got a bed. Got a TV. You know all the things that we like to have, right? So we'd much rather live in the in the house than in the tent. How do we get to the house? Cars. <laughs> Cars is how we would get there from here, right? But if we're talking about God's house. How do we get to God's house? The one that he has built for us in heaven. So, pray, read the Bible, and your heart. Very good. We need to have Jesus in our heart. So let's pray, and then I think there may be some candy in the box here for you, okay? Lord, we just ask that you help us to realize that you've got a house for us, and it's a place, Lord, that we would just love to be. And so, just help us to... to to put you in, first in our lives, to love you, to accept you, to believe in you, so that we can come and live in your house and dwell with you, Lord. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Thank you very much. The opening hymn this morning is, uh, he touched me, and you'll notice that you don't have the sheets in your uh, in your bulletins anymore. Uh, so there should be hymnals there in the pews. Although I don't know whether I've got one. Good thing I brought.
If you would join me in the call to worship. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I have For with the Lord there is steadfast love. And with him is great power to redeem. Would you join me in the morning prayer? Dear Lord, we are so fortunate to be gathered here this morning to hear the good news of the promised spirit of truth. We celebrate that we are a community of people, each at a different point on his or her faith journey, each seeking your healing love and mercy. Help us to bring the good news to them in gentle kindness and compassion and understanding. Let our actions and attitudes reflect all that Jesus taught us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And our next hymn is found on page 630 in the Worship of His Majesty. Uh, Heaven came down and glory filled my soul.
seated. You may be seated. The first of the scriptures this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, uh, the second letter. And uh, hopefully, <laughs> I did not put my bookmark in there. Just a second. Oh, yes, I did. <clears throat> it is from the fourth chapter, verse 13, through the fifth chapter, verse 1. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, and therefore I spoke. We also believe, and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus, and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may, come, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look to things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And then would you please stand for the gospel. The good news according to Mark, uh, the third chapter, uh, verses 20 through 35. And you guys might have noticed, if you haven't, Already in the bulletin, I switched things up. Instead of doing the saying afterwards, we're going to do the Gloria Patri, uh, which is on page 108. But um, just to prepare you. Uh, so Mark 3, 20 through 35. Then the multitudes came together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he is Beelzebub. <clears throat> By the ruler of demons, he casts out demons. So he called them to himself and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. No one, can, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes the Holy Spirit against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. Because they said he has an unclean spirit. Then his brothers and his mother came, and standing outside, they sent to him, calling him. And a multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mothers and brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them, saying, Who is my mother, or who my brothers? And he looked around at the circle who sat about him, and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Sorry guys, I've got cotton mouth this morning. Uh, 
I'm going to um, pray for a moment before we uh, begin. Lord, I just ask that uh, you use me this morning uh, to speak your truth, uh, to reveal uh, what you would have us know this morning, Lord, uh, to your people. We ask these things in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So uh, I intend to speak uh, the majority of what I've got uh, my time today on uh, the letter from Paul uh, the, to the Corinthians, the church at Corinth. Uh, but I do want to take a few minutes uh, before I get started with that uh, to express some thoughts on the gospel text this morning. Uh, in uh, passages prior to our gospel in Mark, to where the gospel was taken from this morning, uh, Jesus is amassing quite a large following. Uh, at the beginning of chapter 3, uh, Jesus help, uh, heals a man uh, in Mark. He heals a man that has a hand that is, uh, uh, is all distorted, and he does it on the Sabbath. And so the religious leaders get all bent out of shape about that. Uh, but there's also large crowds that are coming to him. They're hearing about these healings that are occurring. And so they're coming to Jesus, and they are uh, amassing in large crowds. And we hear, you know, you know the stories of him eating, you know, 5,000 with fish and loaves. Large crowds are coming out to Jesus in the wilderness, wherever he's at. Uh, and they are... Um, there, he's really starting to threaten the power of the political and religious leaders of the time. And so he's gaining a lot of pop popularity, and the, and the religious leaders don't like that. Uh, thus, uh, they come out to him uh, at the part in the scripture where we were at today, and they attempt to discredit him. And so uh, they say that he is uh, all the healing that he's doing, all the miraculous works that he's been doing out there, uh, casting out of demons, he's doing that all by the power of Satan, by Beelzebub. And um, it's in this uh, context uh, that uh, we learn about the unpardonable sin. Uh, in Mark uh, chapter 3, 28 through 29, it says, Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter. Uh, but he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. Uh, as Christians, some of us may sometimes worry, uh, you know, that we are committing uh, that sin. But Jesus does explain to us that the sin is not only ignoring the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we do that. The Holy Spirit is, is trying to move us in a certain direction and we ignore that calling, that nudge uh, from the Holy Spirit. But he says it's not only that. It is actually attributing the work, the miracles, the power of the Holy Spirit to Satan. And therefore, um, we should be very aware uh, of doing that. Uh, but uh, it's not something that you you can you can really do lightly. I mean, you have to be attributing the the works of of God, of His Holy Spirit, uh, to Satan. Uh, we should still be aware, though, and we should avoid the quenching of the Holy Spirit, or the ignoring, or the or the uh, negating, neglecting of the call and the conviction of the Holy Spirit on our lives. As when we do so, if you ignore the Holy Spirit, you're putting a chasm, you're separating yourself uh, from God. And uh, so you, that's obviously something you don't want to do. You want to be growing uh, closer to God. Before I move over to Paul's letter, I do want to mention something else uh, from what Jesus' words that were in Mark there. Uh, he tells the scribes that a house divided against itself cannot stand. And Abraham Lincoln quoted this passage. Uh, he actually had an entire speech uh, focused on this passage back in June of 1858. A house divided against itself cannot stand. He gave it uh, to, to Congress. And in Lincoln's time, uh, slavery was a main issue, of course, that was dividing the country. However, today America seems to be divided by just about everything. Uh, more divided than she has ever been. Uh, we seem to be sharply divided over almost every issue, and we are divided. I worry that the America
that I knew and loved may be gone. May be gone for good. And I wonder if my America, the one that I treasure, has to fall in order for the events that are prophesied in Revelation to occur. With all of the evil that I see foretold in Revelation, the judgments that's coming and the, and the evil that will be on the earth, I really cannot imagine my America standing idly by and letting those things happen. Letting evil rule. Therefore, I come to the conclusion that for those events that are prophesied in Revelation to occur, and they will occur, either America, her trust in God, her morals, her ideals, have to have fallen, or her people have to be so divided amongst themselves that they are bound like the strong man while the world is plunged into evil. Always and every day, but even more fervently in these times, as our Independence Day approaches, uh, we need to be praying for our country. And that thought there is, uh, that last thought's kind of depressing. And I'm afraid, honestly, that things aren't going to get much better for a little, bit, a little while as I get over here into 2 Corinthians. Uh, your outward man is perishing. Since the day of your birth, when you came kicking and screaming into the world, you've been marching towards death. Your outward man has been perishing. As we get older, <laughs> I, I did some work the other day and my shoulder was uh, <laughs> as, it's still bothering me. But as we get older, we, we know, we feel the effects Amen. of that outward man perishing. We definitely can feel it. The perishing of our physical bodies, that outward man. And Paul compares our physical, our fleshly bodies to a tent. A temporary dwelling. Some of our tents, I'll give you this, are better, in better shape than others. Uh, mine needs some work, by the way. But uh, some of them are in better shape than others. But all of our tents are temporary. For those who attend our Monday night Bible studies, uh, you're familiar with the, the consistency of the scriptures. Uh, you're familiar with the various types of and shadows uh, that are found in the scriptures throughout wor uh, God's word. And uh, really, honestly, you, you need to be getting, if you're not, you need to be getting into, into God's word and spending time in God's word. Obviously, uh, we've got Monday night Bible study out here and, and there is lots of good things you can learn in that Bible study. Uh, but God calls you to be in his word daily and learning from the truth that is found there. Uh, so if you can't make the Bible study for whatever reason, just get in there and ask him to reveal his truth to you through the scripture that is in that Bible. But I'm going to share some things this morning that for those of you that are out in Bible study, those are things that you will remember, uh, but and probably... Uh, have you know have heard before but for those who haven't they'll be new the Israelites dwelt in tents as I was telling the children that came forward when God freed the Egyptians uh, they wandered in the desert and they dwelt in tents we also see in Exodus that while they were in the desert uh, they made idols and sinned against God through Moses, God had promised Israel a land of their own. But because of their sins, they were made to wander in the wilderness until all of those who disobeyed God had died. And while they wandered in the wilderness, they dwelt in tents. And the tabernacle went with them. The tabernacle is described in Exodus in great detail. But it and its contents are an earthly copy of God's heavenly tabernacle. 
where he will one day dwell with his people. I sure hope that me and all of you that are listening are up there with him when that roll is called. The Israelites, as they moved in their tents, took the tabernacle with them. And they encamped around the tabernacle. Uh, when all the tribes of Israel were encamped, and there were specific spots that each tribe was supposed to camp uh, that are outlined in Exodus, when they were all encamped around the tabernacle, uh, the formation of a cross is seen. And uh, the tabernacle there is at the heart, at the crossing of those two beams of the cross. Paul tells us, Oh, I'm a little bit ahead of myself there. The Israelites dwelt in tents in the wilderness awaiting the fulfillment of a promise. The promise of the promised land that God had given them. And so, you know, I wonder, are we really all that different? Uh, we dwell in a temporary body. As our friends pass, some of them way too early, we realize the mortal and the temporary nature of our body, of our tent. Like the Israelites, we too have a promised, a prophesied promise, a promised land. Uh, we have sinned, and so we are barred from entry into that promised land at the mo uh, you know, at one point. But like the Israelites, uh, we need to prepare uh, so that we are can be made ready by God for our entry into the promised land. And there are some things in his word that he tells us we need to do. Paul tells us that with all of our afflictions that we have on earth, all of the trials, all of the health problems, all of the things that we have going on, all that stuff is light compared to the eternal reward that's waiting for us. In 2 Corinthians 4 through 16, therefore do not lose heart even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For a light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. For things which are seen are temporary, but those things which are not seen are eternal. Paul tells us that while we're in our wilderness, we need to be focused on the unseen. We need to be focused on the eternal. We need to be focused on God. By focusing on God and his word and communing with him in prayer, we can renew that inward man daily. This idea of a temporary tent, but a promised house that is built by God is prevalent throughout the scriptures. The promised land was given to the Israelites by God. He built and he prepared it for them. And at the appropriate and appointed time, he gave them victory over the inhabitants so that they could dwell there. But, brothers and sisters in Christ, this is but a type and a shadow of what is to come. In 2 Corinthians 5.1, the last of the verses we read from Paul's epistle this morning, Paul draws a contrast between our tent and God's house. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And Peter uses this same tent analogy in, uh, as Paul in 2 Peter uh, 1, 12 through 15. For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, just <clears throat> knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that I always have a reminder, that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Peter tells us that we must uh, put off this temporary tent. And we know this to be true, just as our Lord and Jesus Christ showed us. To enter our promised land, to be with our God, 
We must put off the temporary tent. We must die. Jesus told us in John 14, 1 through 6, that he is going to prepare a place for us. And this heavenly house that Paul tells about, uh, to the, to, tells the church in Corinth about, is what Jesus is talking about. Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. As with many things in God's Word, to fully understand, you need to have some knowledge about Jewish customs at the time, specifically in this particular instance, marriage customs. The entirety of God's Word, if we really get down to it, is all about a wedding and how to get an invitation to that wedding. The entirety of God's Word is about the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, and his bride, the church, you and I. In Jewish marriage customs, when a man wanted to be married, everything began with betrothal. The first major step in the Jewish marriage custom. Betrothal began with the establishment of a marriage covenant. The prospective bridegroom would travel from his house, his father's house, over to his prospective bride's house. And once he got there, he would negotiate the price for the purchase of the young woman with her father to become married to him as his bride. Once the bridegroom had paid the agreed upon price, the marriage covenant was established. And the couple were regarded as husband and wife. From this point on, the bride was considered to be consecrated or set aside ex exclusively for her bridegroom. As a symbol to mark that covenant being established between the bride and the groom, they would drink a cup of wine over which a betrothal benediction had been spoken. Now, when heaven came down, when Jesus came down to the house of his bride, to the earth, and negotiated a price for her with her father, that price was his life. And you can go look this up. I'm not going to read through Matthew 26. But Matthew 26, 36 through 46, where Jesus is praying in the garden, he asked that this cup be taken from him. I believe he's referring to the betrothal cup, symbolizing the price that he would pay for his bride. After the marriage covenant had been established, the groom would then return to his father's house. He would remain there separate from his wife for 12 months. And during this time, the bride would gather all of her things, including her bridal group, and prepare for married life. The groom, on the other hand, busied himself by preparing living accommodations in his father's house, which would be used by his bride. What did Jesus just tell us? I go to prepare a place for you in my father's house. Jesus went to his father's house to provide, prepare a place for his bride. And he will be coming again for his bride. The bride never knew exactly uh, when her groom would come. And therefore she needed to be ready. Hence the parable of the ten virgins which you can find in Matthew 25, 1 through 13. I'm not going to read through that one either. But when all the work was done, 
At the end of that period of separation, the groom would come and take the bride to live with him. This usually took place at night and would involve the groom, his best man, and all the other male escorts who would leave the father's house and form a torchlight procession to the bride's home. Although the bride expected her groom to be coming, she did not know the exact time when he would get there. And therefore, the groom's arrival would be preceded with a shout to let the bride know that the groom was coming. You know what it tells us in Revelation? Chapter 11, verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever. Paul talks about it in his letter to Thessalonica, the first letter to the Thessalonians, 4, uh, four verses 14 through 17. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from the heavens with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive <coughs> and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. After the groom received to him the bride and all of her uh, female attendants with the entire wedding party, they would return to the groom's father's house. Once they arrived, they would find that the wedding guests were assembled there. Not long after their arrival, other members of the bridal party would escort the bride and the groom to the bridal chamber. Prior to entering the chamber, the bride uh, remained veiled so that no one could see her face. While the groomsmen and the bridesmaids waited outside, uh, the groom and the bride would enter the bridal chamber by themselves, and in the privacy of that place, uh, they would for the first time have physical union. And this would signify the consummation of their marriage that had been coveted long before. Are you ready for the bridegroom to come? In the movie that some of us just recently watched, My Brother's Keeper, uh, Ron Preach Percy tells his friend, the main character in the movie, Travis Fox, uh, don't lose your life without knowing that your soul is ready. You are a spirit that possesses a soul and inhabits a body. A temporary tent. Is your soul ready? Do you know that you are consecrated as the bride of Jesus Christ? Have you accepted his free gift of salvation? It's been said that B-I-B-L-E stands for basic instructions before leaving earth. It contains the instructions so that you are ready for the wedding. Are you reading it? Are you living it? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you going to the wedding? A day is coming, a date and time that you do not know when your tent will be destroyed. Are you ready to move into the house the bridegroom has prepared for you? If not, what in the world are you waiting for? If you need help with the invitation to the wedding, reach out to Pastor John, or reach out to me, or reach out to Merle, or reach out to one of the elders of this church, one of the, one of the believers, and get your invitation. Make sure you're ready. Make sure you're going. Don't lose your life without knowing, and I mean knowing, that your soul is ready. 
Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? So that when that roll is called, when that trumpet, that trumpet and the archangel shout, when they sound, you will be the bride of Christ, ready to meet your bridegroom. Do you have any concerns that you would like to bring before them? Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word, Lord. We ask that you, uh, that you reveal truth to us daily uh, in your word. Help us to, to know that we are ready, to know that we have been consecrated as your bride, Lord. We ask that you uh, help us to also reach out to all those people that we run into on a daily basis, Lord, and, and help them with their invitation. Help them know you the way that we know you, Lord. Help us to, to share the good news that we have because it is such great news. So we just ask that you would help us share it always and everywhere to as many people as we can for as long as we can. We ask these things in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, as we say the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, if the ushers would come forth, we're going to go ahead and pass the offering plates this Sunday. So... just thank you for the blessings that you have given to us. We thank you for the, the small portion that we return to you, Lord. We ask that you bless and multiply these gifts, that they will be used for your ministry, your outreach, your spreading your good news to all of those around us, Lord. We ask these things in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is uh, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder, page 692.
receive the benediction. Father, we just ask that you help us do everything in our power to make sure that when that roll is called up yonder, we're there. Our name is written in the book of life. And Lord, let, let us take as many of the, the people around us with us as we possibly can. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.